Good afternoon. We have everybody's attention. Uh, my name is Mark Yoder. I'm the president of the Greater West's Chamber of Commerce, and I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedules to be here. Um, before we get started, I also want to, of course, thank Congressman Meehan and Congressman Gerlach for being here. We appreciate them taking their time to give us some updates. Um, as we typically do at our chamber luncheons, um, I wanted to make some introductions. So I'd like to start by introducing our board members who are here today. Ron Delavecchia, Delavecchia, Riley Smith and Boyd Funeral Home. Um, Mike Brown of KMRD Partners. Scott Mays of Comcast Spotlight, who's our chairman this year. And Donna Urian of Fisher Cunane. Where's Donna? So thank you for our board members for being here today. We also like to take these opportunities um, to introduce new members, members who have joined in the last you know, several months, who are coming out and supporting. Not only is this a great opportunity for them to meet the general membership, but it's also a chance as members to reach out to them once you know who they are and welcome them into our Greater Westchester Chamber family. So John O'Brien would Take Shape for Life, another new member today. today. Thank you, John. I also would like to thank our ambassadors, who, um, who are one of our committees that are very involved with the chamber. Um, this group reaches out to our existing members, reaches out to new members, welcomes them in. Um, the chamber and the ambassador um, department has, um, ambassador committee has introduced a mentor program. So the first 18 months of a new member's membership, they will be approached um, several times to really help them get uh, um, acclimated to the chamber and the benefits of the chamber. So I want to thank, it's a lot of hard work for our ambassadors. So I want to thank Brian Stevenson of Wells Fargo, who is our chairman of that committee and Tracy McNichol of U Financial. So thank you to both our ambassadors for being here today. Um, so in a second, I'm going to bring um, Ron Delavecchia, who is the um, vice chair of our governing legislative committee, who will be doing the introductions today up here. But I want to make a couple of announcements first. Um, on your tables, there will be some index cards. If you have some questions for the congressman, Please write those questions um, on the index cards and then raise your hand and one of our staff members will come by to pick up those questions. Um, we are going to try to get as many questions as we can, um, so make sure that you, you get that to us so that we can um, ask those questions. Of course, you know, we probably won't be able to get to all questions, but we hope to uh, at least uh, maximize our time with that. So we'll have presentations from first from uh, um, Congressman Meehan, and then from Congressman, or I'm sorry, Congressman Gerlach, and then Congressman Meehan, and then I will be back up here to um, initiate the Q&A session. So with that, let me introduce Ron Delavecchia. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Congressman Jim Gerlach. He is now serving in his fifth term in the U.S. House of Representatives. He serves the 6th Congressional District, covering parts of Berks, Chester, Lebanon, and Montgomery counties. Congressman Gerlach serves on the, as a member of the powerful House Ways and Means Committee, and also on the Health Subcommittee and the Select Revenue Subcommittee. The Congressman's distinguished career in public service representing the citizens of southeastern Pennsylvania began in 1990. His first two terms in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives followed by two terms in the state Senate. His tireless effort over the past 12 years to help promote an effective government has saved Pennsylvania taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars. Congressman Gerlach was a prime sponsor of the landmark welfare reform legislation that reduced the state's welfare rolls by an impressive 150,000 cases. One of his biggest legislative accomplishments was creating a much needed National Veterans Cemetery in southeastern Pennsylvania. As a funeral director, thank you. And in 2009, Washington Crossing opened in Bucks County. Congressman Gerlach currently lives in Chester Springs with his wife Karen and their six children. Please give a warm welcome to Congressman Jim Gerlach. Well, 
Well, thank you and good afternoon, everybody. What a great pleasure it is uh, to be here with you and to uh, be with my colleague Pat Meehan to be able to go over some federal issues and get your thoughts and comments and questions on what's happening or not happening in Washington, D.C., depending on your perspective. And uh, I think my role is to give a few minutes of uh, a uh, few minutes of commentary on a couple issues, turn it over to Congressman Meehan, and then we're going to do a Q&A, which will be, I think, the most valuable part of our get-together today, just to hear back from you on, on issues of importance. Uh, let me take my time to focus around the jurisdictional responsibilities of the committee I serve on, Ways and Means. And uh, before I do that, uh, just to give uh, some geographical understanding of what has happened as a result of redistricting, uh, the 6th Congressional District, which is parts, as, as was mentioned by Ron, Chester, Montgomery, Berks, and Lehigh, changes as a result of that redistricting, so that now the 6th District comes down and includes the borough of Westchester, East West Goshen, Thornberry, uh, Willistown, uh, West Town, and East Town, uh, continues to go up through the Downingtown area and Cowntownship Township area, all the way up to Phoenixville, and then into other parts of Montgomery, uh, Berks County, but now also Lebanon County, all the way over to the city of Lebanon. So it uh, changes uh, and shifts to the to the uh, to the west a little bit, but uh, uh, about 40 percent of the congressional district remains in Chester County, and uh, we look forward to continuing to represent the folks now that are going to be in those new municipalities uh, in the years ahead. Uh, on the Ways and Means front, there's a lot of issues that have been discussed and brewing. And as we head into what's called the lame duck period, that period between the election and the end of the year, uh, a lot of issues are facing us uh, as members of Congress, including the fiscal cliff, whether all the 2001-2003 tax rates will snap back up to their higher, lovers, uh, higher levels by January 1st, or whether or not we'll come to some agreement to extend out the current tax code as is. Uh, the issue of what's called sequestration, uh, cutting about $1.2 trillion out of both the defense side and non-defense side of the budget. Uh, a doc fix issue whether those that care for Medicare patients will receive a 27 percent uh, reduction in reimbursements uh, for the patients they care for. Uh, whether or not there will be an extension of the 2 percent payroll tax cut that occurred last year and is still in place through the end of the year. Whether that will be extended or not. So you have all these issues swirling around at the end of the year in that lame duck period with very little uh, clarity as of yet as to what's going to happen during that period. But as for ways and means issues, we have been focused on a couple things. One, there are about 60 provisions in the tax code that expired at the end of last year or will expire at the end of this, end of this year. And so the question is whether those uh, issues will be included in what's called a tax extenders bill and be passed by Congress and extend those provisions. Some of them are business related. Some of them include, such as the conservation easement deduction uh, that was in place for, hand, uh, for landowners to put some of their land into conservation easements and get a, a deduction from that. So one of the big issues we'll take up will be whether to have a tax extenders bill and uh, what will be included in that. Uh, we obviously uh, are going to do what we can to try to prevent this tax hike from occurring at the start of the year, in fact, in the House of Representatives, we passed before the August recess, H.R. 8, to basically keep, keep the tax code in place for another year through 2013 while we in Congress work on major comprehensive tax code reform. Uh, we passed that in the, uh, in the House. It's over in the Senate. So while there is uh, some media reporting that the Congress has done nothing to prevent that uh, from occurring, the House, in fact, has acted and we've passed the bill and it's over in the Senate sitting there. So we're hoping uh, Senate Leader uh, Harry Reid takes that bill up as soon as possible so that we can uh, try to get some agreement on that. As we look into the next Congress, uh, tax code reform, however, is going to be a really big part of what Ways and Means does. We have a, a hugely complicated tax code, uh, a tax code that has grown from 1.4 million words in 2000 to 3.4 million words uh, in 2012 and continues to grow and get complicated. We want to try to simplify that code, make it more equitable, and allow it to foster more uh, investment in our economy. Uh, there are a number of our competitor countries around the world that have what's called a territorial tax code. We in the United States have a worldwide tax code, meaning we tax you not only what you earn here in the United States, but we'll tax you on what you earn abroad when you bring those earnings back. And for the fact that we have a 35% tax rate, now the highest in the world, 
uh, it's not surprising then that there's hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in foreign earnings by American countries that are being kept offshore because they don't want to bring it back to the United States and be taxed at 35 percent. So we would like to move our tax code from a worldwide tax code system to a territorial system and in essence encourage and incentivize American companies earning foreign revenues to bring them back here to the United States and invest them here in the United States, which we think would be a great stimulus to the private sector economy. If we're also going to stimulate and foster growth, uh, we want to lower that 35 percent to a maximum of 25 percent for uh, a corporate taxation. And recognizing that most of the businesses in the United States are not actually C-Corps, they are pass-through entities. Many of you are pass-through entities, uh, subchapter S is LLCs, limited partnerships, sole proprietors. It would be unfair and inequitable to have C-Corps tax at a maximum of 25%, and you who pay uh, an individual tax rate for your business income, uh, we want to lower the maximum individual rate to 25% as well and create that uh, equity. But to have a tax revenue bill, uh, bill we then would have to expand uh, the base of, uh, of the code uh, in order to create tax uh, neutrality. And so a lot of our discussion coming up uh, through this uh, end of this year and into next year will be what do you keep in the tax code and what do you take out of the tax code if you're otherwise going to lower the maximum rates. And that's going to be a heck of a discussion and I'm not quite sure how it's all going to turn out. But there is great interest in simplifying the code and taking out a lot of loopholes, deductions, exemptions, if you're going to lower the maximum rates. And we think by doing that, we're going to, we're going to foster more economic growth here in this country. So that will continue to play out as we get into the next Congress. And we're going to want to have your input, your feedback as proposals start to get, uh, get written and put on, uh, put on the floor. And love to have your feedback on what you think the tax code changes ought to be. So with that, that's a quick uh, thumbnail on a couple tax issues. Uh, I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for Q&A and want to obviously uh, leave plenty of time for Congressman Meehan to also uh, make his comments and then we can both, I guess, together take, uh, take your Q&A. So let's do that. All right. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Congressman. At this time, I'd like to introduce Congressman Patrick Meehan. He represents the Pennsylvania's 7th Congressional District, the United States Congress. Elected in 2010, Congressman Meehan serves on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, Homeland Security Committee, and Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. As a member of the Homeland Security Committee, he was appointed chairman of the Subcommittee on Counterterrorism and Intelligence, becoming one of only a few freshmen to chair that subcommittee. He set up an anti-terrorism advisory <coughs> council to coordinate the region's response to an attack, which then became a national model for the coordination of all law enforcement. Congressman Meehan served as district attorney of Delaware County, and as district attorney, he formed the Internet Crimes Against Children's Task Force, which is a working group dedicated to protecting children from online predators. He served as the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, a position that made him a top federal prosecutor in a district that spanned nine counties with a population of over five million residents. During his tenure, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Philadelphia became a national leader in prosecuting corrupt government officials earning him great respect from both sides of the political spectrum. On a personal note, prior to entering public service, Congressman Meehan spent two years as a national hockey referee, which is a true hockey fan would like for you to interfere and intervene and get this lockout started. Thank you. So at this time, Congressman Meehan and his wife Carol and their three sons live in Drexel Hill. So please give a warm welcome for Congressman Pat Meehan. Well, good afternoon. It's a, it's a delight to be here with my colleague uh, Jim and to, to be before you today. I, I noticed as the introductions were, were being given in recognition of 
the really very significant membership Jim has on the Ways and Means Committee. I kept waiting for the announcement to talk about being a member of that powerful Homeland Security Committee, but the it is uh, powerful. <laughs> the, uh, but it is a delight to uh, to be with you here today, and I thank you for the chance to give you a little insight on on, on what is happening uh, uh, in Washington uh, and how it relates back here to to the district. And I think that was where I re really like to begin uh, my comments because I approached it uh, as a freshman with the recognition that you're part of a large body and you will have the ability to be part of the the dynamic that takes place with the votes that you cast, but uh, at the same time, uh, we represent a region that, that is unique and that has some challenges, and the quest was how to use the relationships that we have uh, among ourselves, uh, certainly as members of the same party, but even with those who are our colleagues from this region, looking at local issues and finding ways to work together to try to make an impact, to use the bully pulpit <coughs> of the office, so to speak, to have an impact on issues uh, before us. And certainly I think that uh, I have found a great deal of fulfillment in the ability to get involved in some things which I think have had a, an important impact uh, on our regional economy. Uh, one of the things that is paramount has been the tremendous challenge that we faced as a region. Uh, we have been working on the concern about what might happen to the uh, energy sector if we, if we had challenges that were largely based at the time we were looking at from the, the, the increased regulation and other things, what might happen with our refineries. And it was a real sort of kick in the gut for our region to be looking at the potential loss of three refineries uh, and there literally a thousand, some estimate, uh, in, in excess of tens of thousands of direct and indirect jobs that would have percolated throughout our entire region. The history has been written or is being written as people go through, but I, I think it was a, a, a very important uh, and significant regional accomplishment and one in which it was generated by the collaboration of, 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 of people from both parties at all levels of government creating the kind of environment that, that invited and worked with those who came in with new ideas and ways to generate uh, different uses of those tremendous assets. It has actually put us back in play as, a, I think, a significant energy player moving forward, and there's great potential down there for a, an expanding economy to grow off not only the, the uses that have been uh, put into place, but the relationship back to the tremendous resource we have uh, in Marcellus Shale. So I think that was a, a, a great save for our region. Uh, participated very directly in the negotiations to after 20 years of frustration, uh, the ability to finally get through the Congress the uh, support for the deepening of the Delaware River. Now this, of course, had a lot of challenges prior to this point, uh, but ultimately uh, Jim and I were able to work and, and support uh, and actually advocate for uh, the inclusion of, of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, particularly in, the, uh, in this current budget that dedicates the money and if we did not deepen that river, there was a great concern uh, that we would atrophy as the Panama Canal opens and you begin to see trade expand dramatically at the ports throughout the United States. We would not be able to compete for those goods. And once again, the impact, it's not just the port itself. It's central to our infrastructure and the implications of could have been significant. I got a chance to work very, very directly with uh, some of the folks at uh, the, the, at the prior uh, Sunoco, uh, but at the time there was the, uh, the ability to, to do something uh, getting uh, vessels reflagged under the Jones Act that enabled them to be positioned so that now they can be put to work uh, taking advantage of the ability to move the natural gas uh, throughout our region, and, and that should be something of a job creator, not a huge job creator, but it was, you know, this was work that was done before the, the rebirth, but once again, an important new opportunity to take advantage of, of the economies that can be generated down there uh, in a new fashion. Uh, the districts and our region, of course, are complex, and there's a lot of other interests, and I think when you come out here, it, it is so focused on a lot of the economy that we have, which is driven by the life sciences. We are an area that is rich in the kind of, of uh, investment of, of capital and, and uh, headquarters and things with the uh, bio, bio companies and pharma and, and technology that's related to that. Uh, a 
a real healthcare center with the great teaching hospitals we have, uh, teaching institutions, uh, research, and a lot of the things that are tied together. So working closely, trying to look at that industry and finding ways to work effectively with that industry is something that I know I have uh, spent a great deal of time and, and have collaborated with Jim on a, on a number of things. Uh, I was able to, on, on, on one of my committees, we were able to actually spearhead something I've worked with Senator Leahy and one of my Democrat colleagues on an issue that doesn't rise to the front of everybody's attention level, but we're able to enhance the penalties on, on counterfeit drugs. People do not appreciate the impact that has on the manufacturers, but more significant, the, uh, the, the number of people who are harmed by virtue of going onto the internet because of the growing amount of, uh, you know, cost of drugs, so they, they look in alternative places. It has a, a real impact on the industry, but it also has a genuine health impact. Jim and I have worked together on a couple of other very important issues. Uh, Jim talked about stranded assets uh, overseas. Now, we have proposed working with the idea of uh, enabling the uh, a life sciences tax credit, so to speak, to come back to repatriate some of those foreign profits to allow them to be brought back into here uh, at a, a significantly reduced tax, uh, allowing the first uh, 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 $150,000 uh, to be utilized in investment uh, in, uh, in, in research and development here in the region to come in tax-free and, and entice us to allow people to be put to work here doing the research and development, not shipping those jobs overseas. So this is part of the collaboration, working on the matters. Uh, Jim and I have spent a lot of time, we, we were together on the conservation uh, tax easement, an a thing that's very important to numbers of the open space uh, uh, supporters uh, in this area. So examples of things that we've tried to fight for that make a difference to us here in the region. We're part of the big picture, and of course we're all as a nation looking at the big challenges that we face. In an economy in which unemployment continues to uh, exceed 8% for uh, more than 46 months. So the great challenge is, you know, how do we get people back to work? How do we get this economy going? And when I talk to small business people and I talk to people who are, who, who, who are in the business of, of investment and risk taking, I think there's a great concern about uncertainty. The word that I hear continuously is uncertainty. And the unwillingness until they understand what the rules are to, to, to make the commitment. And while a lot of discussion has taken place about things that are done, everything from quantitative easement to, you know, the kinds of programs which are supposed to you know, sort of juice the economy and get people going again, uh, the, the uh, you know, the stimulus types of things that the government has been involved in, the fact of the matter is we're sitting on trillions of dollars that are tucked away in corporate balance sheets and other kinds of places which are ripe to make the kind of investment if, in fact, they feel confident and the ability to, to take risk and to make that investment. So the challenge for us is to find a way to work on the kind of dynamic that will, that will invite that. I think you had an excellent opportunity uh, with, with Jim, who was deeply immersed uh, in the Ways and Means Committee, on a lot of discussions of the ways the taxes can be worked and structured to help to attract that kind of investment. Uh, you know, certainly a key is the ability to work in some way uh, to, to deal with the, uh, with the recognition that tax policy influences what people are going to do uh, with their investments. And one of the concerns that I have is, uh, as we discuss the various uh, options that are out there, is what Jim had identified, which is the pass-through corporations the businesses that, that create many of the small jobs, which are the economic engine for uh, job creation. In, in this economy and virtually all of the economies, uh, as you go through, the small businesses will, will drive an awful lot of that. And there's a high percentage of businesses. Some estimate that as many as you know, 900,000 jobs could be impacted uh, if, if pass-throughs have to face higher rates and then divert some of those monies away from investment uh, in, in, in their own businesses. Of course, uh, I'll sort of close on the, the issue. Uh, many are continuing to be faced with increasing costs uh, of health care. And so what is going to happen as we move forward with the 
overall continuing escalating costs of uh, provision of health. I, mean, I think one of the facts we deal with right now is the, uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act is the law. So, so, so what is going to happen? Uh, we already know what has happened. One has been that it, it has not contained the costs in the way that it was advertised to do so. The average person uh, in, a, in a small business has seen uh, their policies actually increase in cost. I think there's been some 300, close to $347 billion worth of, of uh, greater costs than, than was estimated. So the real question is, are we going to find a way uh, with this system to, to, to be able to control costs and simultaneously, you know, what is actually going to happen? I would suggest to you a lot of it has to do with what happens with this election, but that's where people, uh, you know, the voters themselves will influence some of that outcome. And I say that because I suspect, uh, you know, the president is reelected. He is going to be reticent to uh, sign any bill that that you know overturns uh, his signature. So there's going to be a lot of uh, on the plate, I think, awaiting what, what happens uh, in this cycle. But it is uh, notwithstanding, as Jim said, uh, when we return, whatever happens in that, in, in that election cycle, we all will be facing the, the short-term challenges of the, the fiscal cliff, which I think Jim laid out so well. So we've got uh, a lot of work ahead still. Ultimately, hopefully, what happens is the ability to create the kind of uh, environment in which there is a little bit more predictability, there is a little bit more certainty with respect to the policies. We're still going to have difficult challenges as we look at European markets, Asian markets now, uh, influencing the world picture, but the ability for us to be able to create some kind of opportunity for people to have the confidence to reinvest is what I think is going to be the key to getting America back to work. So I thank you uh, for your attention. I, we did not discuss, Jim or I, any of the issues uh, that, that are not quite as close to home but very real, which is uh, many of the things that are happening as a, in an increasingly challenging and uh, increasingly unsafe world. Uh, I do get to see that in my position as the uh, chairman of the Counterterrorism and Intelligence Committee for Homeland but uh, you're all aware of the huge issues that seem to be percolating uh, in, uh, you know, primarily uh, in the Middle East, drawing from uh, uh, the concern about a nuclear Iran on top of it. So uh, we simultaneously have real uh, challenges uh, that we face as a, as a member, and, and I would suggest to you as uh, the most significant uh, nation among nations in, uh, in the world. So I. Look forward to uh, the opportunity to sit here with my colleague and uh, entertain your questions. Uh, or Jim and I can give long supplemental speeches if you would like. And, uh, but uh, I thank you for the chance to be with you and look forward to, uh, to our dialogue. Jim. Congressman Meehan and Congressman Gerlach, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come today to be with the Chamber to help us to better understand many positions that are happening within our country. Once again, Mark Yoder would like to field in the questions at this time. Mark? Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Again, thank you to both of you for being here. We have some great questions. If you have any further questions as we're moving forward, just make sure you raise your hand and Alex will uh, grab them for you. Um, first, I'm going to start with uh, Congressman Meehan. Um, sorry, I'm still doing that wrong. I apologize. Um, when, when, it, when I was a referee, believe me, they just didn't call me a name. They called me names. <laughs> How do you foresee the national health care plan impacting patient care? Well, what concerns me with patient care right now is the ability for patients to make decisions with the consultation of their physicians and have that drive the practice. I was talking to a physician the other day who said to me that the problem is they've got two or three other people now in the room with them looking over their shoulder as they discuss the health care of their patient, symbolically saying that there's all kinds of other people now who are involved in the decision making with the uh, with the provision of care. I, I am concerned about the, 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 the uh, potential that we are going to uh, drive ourselves further away from the, you know, the physician-centered practice 
uh, and the, you're seeing more and more docs right now that are reluctant uh, to, to uh, get into uh, the practice. Uh, we're, we're losing more and more as they either uh, retire or move into other kinds of things. Uh, we have a big issue with the doc fix to deal with the issue of reimbursements, but as you drive reimbursements down, uh, which you know we've got to consider how to control costs, but as you continually drive reimbursements down uh, and you dramatically expand <coughs> the uh, number of people who are trying to get in to see a particular doc, one of the issues is going to be that you will have a card that says that you have accessibility, but the question is going to be availability and, and the extent to which we're going to see a tremendous movement towards uh, what will be the creation of two tiers of health care. And I don't know for sure that this can be the thing, but you're going to start seeing those that will then go out and create a, you know, a, a higher tier of health care that people will buy into that will have unique access. Uh, but my concern is that we may, uh, that we have a system that has, uh, that has a lot of great problems, but a lot of things that worked well. And I'm afraid that I'm concerned about the potential that we push away from that physician-patient relationship and have it, you know, driven more by uh, factors outside. Sorry. Congressman Gerlach, um, do you foresee any congressional action that can help with gas prices? Yeah, I think uh, an issue we've been struggling with as a country for decades is this issue of energy independence. When we see price of gas get to be $4 a gallon, everybody talks about the importance of breaking our dependence on foreign oil and become energy self-sufficient. And then when gas prices go down to near to $3 or even under $3, we seem to lose focus as a country on that and focus on other issues. I think it's absolutely essential that we put in place uh, a sort of man in the moon by the end of the decade kind of initiative to once and for all become energy self-sufficient where we won't have in the future this roller coaster of energy prices that create the instability for job creators, as Pat mentioned, just like tax uh, policy does, regulatory policy, and health care policy. Uh, I was uh, uh, pleased to see that uh, and participate, as Pat did, in a number of votes uh, over this past year and a half in the House to try to get us into a position of becoming more energy self-sufficient. Uh, self-sufficiency by opening up more domestic production of oil and natural gas uh, offshore and in fact tie that into uh, our transportation infrastructure needs here in this country. Uh, right now we rely strictly on the federal gas tax and state gas tax to fund transportation infrastructure. Uh, those revenues aren't coming in as at the high, high levels that they were before because people are driving less miles and people are using more fuel efficient cars which is a good thing but the revenues coming from those taxes are lower than they used to be and so there's not enough money to do the kinds of projects that we need done in our communities and so we'd like to see uh, some of the royalty revenues that come to the federal government from offshore drilling for oil and natural gas be channeled directly into transportation infrastructure and supplement the liquid fuels tax so we have more dollars to do transportation infrastructure but ultimately we've taken the position in the house that we ought to have an all the above energy independent strategy uh, more domestic production of oil and natural gas, but also keep focusing on non-fossil fuel based uh, energy sources, renewables and alternatives, and also energy conservation and energy efficiency initiatives, all the above to finally break our dependence on foreign oil and Venezuela oil and uh, ultimately allow us to have that stability of pricing, which is so critical for employers as they plan ahead for what their, uh, what their business is going to be like. So, I think we're at a point where we understand we need an energy independent strategy and hopefully in the 113th Congress uh, and whoever is elected president will have finally that kind of uh, initiative moving forward that will allow us to get to that point. Great. Thank you. Um, we're going to stay on transportation. I'm going to open this up to either one of you. Um, any chance for expanded mass transit into Westchester, specifically the Elwin line? Uh, well, well. I think the Elwin line, let me first t touch that issue, I think the Elwin line is already doing an expansion uh, a little bit further out. The right-of-ways do exist into Westchester. My, my suspicion is that it would be uh, competing against a line that already runs out of Westchester. So whether or not, uh, you know, the local transportation authority would, would make a judgment that it was uh, economically feasible to do so, I don't know. I think the existing infrastructure is such that they can get it out to the next station 
and they've made a determination to build a station uh, one more step out beyond where it is uh, on, on, on this side of Westchester to deal with the growing population uh, that is out in the uh, in the in the suburban areas uh, there, uh, but but Jim touched on something when we're talking about transportation policy, uh, and I think he hit on an important point that was part of what we uh, we're, we're giving a lot of consideration to. And I had the uh, uh, I, I was pleased with the opportunity to, to be given a chance to serve on the transportation committee, uh, where we actually did pass an aviation bill and did pass a transportation bill. Uh, I would like to have seen a longer transportation bill so we could have made a long-term in investment in infrastructure. Uh, but that will be the stuff of the next Congress. The question that Jim well articulated is uh, how do we do the pay-fors to be able to afford uh, you know, the investment in infrastructure at a time in which gas revenues are actually creating less in the way of support. Traditionally, it has been paid for with the revenues from the taxes, and then the difference was just made up at the general fund. And there was a halt put to that support that came in, and now a gap. So the question becomes, how do you generate the revenues? And I know uh, we spent a great deal of time talking on the committee about utilizing uh, the opportunity that we have to responsibly and I mean that, responsibly explore for the energy resources we have off the continental shelf on public lands and otherwise. And the estimates are that if you took that, that reservoir, it would both help us with becoming energy, uh, more energy self-sufficient here by using the resources that we have, uh, but in addition, you would be able to uh, create lease rights for those uh, and have streams of income that would be guaranteed for those who, who want to pay the fees to have the rights to the exploration. And then you can take that stream of income and you can bond that up front. And then we would be able to use that bonding and that, that money to be available to invest uh, in, in long-term investment in our infrastructure. Now, that was a concept that was discussed a great deal. The issue becomes what they call dynamic scoring. And when it's estimated by some who actually predict knowing what the reservoirs are and then as a business person can look and see what they anticipate the, the sort of the value uh, and the future value of, of those if they are developed, <clears throat> it's different in Washington in which, and Jim may know a little bit more about this being the, uh, you know, the the budget expert, but it is, uh, you know, dynamic scoring doesn't allow you to make that kind of prediction. You only get what's currently coming in. So I think they underpredict what's available. And those who, who this was a bipartisan effort uh, that was done with some folks uh, who, who, who have paid attention to this issue, and there's a belief that you would have substantial new revenues that could be invested uh, in our infrastructure and the ability to make the kind of long-term investment that would help us compete globally. Thank you. Congressman Gerlach, what loopholes or exemptions do you view as having the greatest chance for being eliminated in an effort to simplify the tax code? Well, uh, the committee is actually in the process now of trying to establish the metrics and objective criteria we're going to utilize to try to figure out the answer to that question, what to keep in the code and what to take out. I think on the flip side of that question, there are some um, areas of the code that would be very difficult for me to foresee or to believe that Congress is going to take them out of the code, such as the home mortgage interest deduction and the charitable deduction, which is so important to so many nonprofit entities in our communities. I find it really hard to believe those kinds of provisions would be removed. But uh, I would think more on the business-related side, there may be uh, some provisions that could be looked at and there has been formed in Washington what's called the Rate Coalition. It's a group of companies that basically take the position that if you lower our maximum corporate rate to 25 percent then we are willing to give up all the other business related deductions and credits that we get such as the R&D tax credit, the Section 179 business expensing, the bonus depreciation, um, things of that nature because by lowering that rate uh, to that level um, and by taking out uh, those provisions from the code, you've really simplified the code from a compliance standpoint and with that uh, new effective rate of 25 percent, 
uh, we think that's a fair uh, place to end up. So there is this coalition, a number of companies that have taken the position, you just lower the rate to 25%, you can get rid of all the business-related deductions and expenses. Of course, there are other businesses and other industries uh, that say even if you lower it to 25%, we still would need the retention of some of these provisions within the business sections of the tax code to remain. So uh, bottom line is there's no one answer to that question as of yet, and that's why I've advocated within the committee, and I think our committee generally agrees with the proposition. Let's come up with the objective criteria by which we're going to make this decision. What are the goals that we want to achieve out of this kind of reform? And ultimately, if a bill's put on the floor and we have to vote on it, we have to come back to our districts. We have to explain why we voted uh, yes or no to a particular proposition. And so we ought to have the criteria and the metrics around which we can make that decision so we can explain it to our constituents. So that's the process that's going to unfold. And where it ends up, uh, no one knows for sure. But uh, there are some provisions I don't think, uh, no matter what you do to reform the code, are going to be taken out. But uh, I would think more on the business side, if you lower that rate maximum to both individual and corporate at 25 percent, there are a lot of companies that say I could give up some credits, deductions, et cetera, in exchange for that. Thank you. I'm going to open this up to either of you as well. Can you clarify your stances on Medicare, especially due to all the attention it's receiving in the presidential campaign? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about an open-ended question. Mm -hmm. uh, look, we, we, we uh, you know, the Republicans have put up a, a budget that looked at trying to find a way to deal with the reality that within 12 years, uh, you know, we're going to see the inability to meet the obligations that we have under Medicare. And the efforts that, that we have undertaken have been a part to put on the table for discussion, an approach in which you say, you know, we've got to find some way to strengthen and to preserve Medicare so it's there to meet the obligations uh, for future generations. And so what you have seen is, is, is the Ryan proposal has looked at the idea of creating a, a concept called premium support in which there would be the ability for an individual to have the, the uh, you know, a, a, a level of support uh, from the government that would uh, rise uh, to some extent with your economic circumstances so that it would be higher as your economic circumstances were, uh, you know, were, 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 were worse and have the ability to create the kinds of uh, networks that will compete for that business and then to use that competition as a way to hold down the costs and then have the ability of the other kinds of things we'd like to see done such as allowing well, I just sat at the table with a couple of small businesses who said you know I'm in a three or four person business we can't compete for insurance we have no capacity to go out and get a quote because you know we get the straight quote because there's just three of us and there's there's you know there's 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 no give there and so what do we do and so you know one of the other things we're we're looking at as well is the ability to create the kinds of pools that will uh, attract uh, small businesses uh, into one large network, uh, much like federal employees, so that you have the ability to. To, to compete for, for uh, better rates. That would certainly also occur with uh, uh, the ability to do things across state lines. So I think that, the, you know, the, the, they've laid it out. I mean, uh, Paul Ryan put up a, a plan. Uh, as I said, I think it's, it's, it's a place for us to, to begin to have a serious adult conversation about, uh, about a, a program that, if nothing is done, uh, it won't be able to meet its obligations. Yeah, I agree with Pat, and uh, what, you, what you understand quickly and you dig into this issue, the trustees, the Medicare trustees themselves have said this program is going bankrupt in 10 years. So a number of things would happen if that were to occur. Either it does go bankrupt and you don't have the program any longer, or you have to very severely limit the benefits under the current program, or you have to take huge chunks of money out of other parts of the federal budget to supplement what's coming in to that program today. So that's why if we're going to have this program available to future generations, we do have to undertake reforms to the program. It doesn't mean somebody that's in the program today will be affected. If you've worked for 40 years or so, you've expected this program to be in place, it ought to be there and will be there. Or if you're within 10 years of retirement, age 55 or more, it should be there for you because you've planned for that as you've gone through your working career. But if we're going to keep this program available to younger people, there are going to have to be reforms, and Pat mentioned the premium support uh, model. That's the model that's already working 
in the Part D part of the program that was established about, what, seven or eight years ago, the pharmaceutical assistance. A senior comes into the plan, looks at a number of different uh, uh, options, decide which one works best for him or her, makes the decision to participate in that, in that plan. The federal government then pays the plan provider for that senior's participation in that plan. And because of the competition among the plans and the plan providers wanting to have as many seniors sign up for that plan, that has actually lowered the costs that were projected to be uh, a part of that plan, the program cost over 10 years. And so that competition is working. And we think that kind of model needs to be expanded into the rest of the program so that you have a Medicare program available to seniors in future years, but instead of, as is today, growing at 7.5% per year and projected to grow ad infinitum at that level as you have almost 10,000 baby boomers coming into the retirement uh, system now every day, unless we get a hold of that growing cost curve and lower it, not decrease the cost of funds going into the program, but rather than growing at 7.5 percent, have it grow at a more modest 4 percent per year. Uh, that, uh, if we don't do that, this program is not going to be around for future generations. And so that's the kind of thing we're talking about to get a handle on this before really severe ha decisions have to be made in about 10 years as to what's going to happen with the program. And we'd love to see some of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle offer their ideas of what they would do to protect the program. We haven't seen any of those. So uh, we're getting shot at by a few folks for what's been proposed in the House. But it seems to me this is a very serious issue. If you want to be a serious legislator, you want to be a serious uh, body within Congress, you've got to come up with some ideas or let the other folks uh, move forward. But uh, complaining about uh, what one plan is and not coming up with one of your own to me is uh, the height of irresponsibility, and that seems to be what we have right now in Washington. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We've got about five minutes left, so um, if everybody's keeping watch, uh, I'm going to try to end this in about five minutes. So with that, uh, Congressman, how can unemployment compensation be reformed to return people to work? Well, the best way is not to necessarily reform unemployment conversation. It's to get people back to work to give them a job so they don't need unemployment compensation. I mean, I think that's really the key. And what I would be working on would be to find a way, as we said at the outset, which is to uh, get our economy back into a point in which people have the confidence to invest the money that they, uh, that they have already sitting on the sidelines. And in addition, I think we also need to do a little bit more uh, I've been meeting with a variety of people, both small business people and uh, uh, and uh, uh, builders and other kinds. You know, we're talking right now about green shoots and the ability to come out. There's still an awful lot of oversight here on the local level in which uh, we've replaced the ability for decisions to be made, responsible decisions to be made at a local level. You know, bankers have been community bankers for years, and they've prospered because they've understood their community. And we have, uh, we, we live in a world now in which, you know, we've created these great big sort of uh, global financial institutions and, uh, you know, efforts were made to rein in the, uh, you know, the, 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 the activities of, on, on the, 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 the mega scale, but it's rained down and had a significant impact on the local level, particularly the small, medium-sized banks and the small businesses that are going to them for loans. And we need to get back into a point where common sense and discretion uh, uh, and judgment become once again part of the formula. I can't tell you how many times, you know, small business people come to me and they'll say, uh, you know, I've, I've got a 10 or 15 year track record. Uh, and I've demonstrated the ability of the highs and the lows and all these things to meet my obligations. And then I go to the bankers and the bankers tell you, well, I can't do it because I got a regulator that's telling me, you know, you've got to meet these kinds of standards. And I, and so I, I think it's a combination, creating the right environment and having the ability to have confidence again and allowing people to, uh, to, 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 to make good judgments because the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of good business that was being done when discretion was, was honored at the local level. Uh, and I think we need to get back there. Great. All right, this will be the last question. This will be for Congressman Gerlach. What impact will change to a territorial tax versus a worldwide tax? while neutralizing pass-through taxes for small businesses have on a national deficit, and what is the proposed revenue potential from an attractive foreign investment? 
we had a hearing on this last year in the committee and we heard testimony from a number of representatives from major companies that have significant foreign earnings that they would bring back, uh, as I said earlier, hundreds of billions of dollars in those foreign earnings uh, back here to the United States that would be used for a multitude of purposes. Uh, some would use those dollars for more R&D uh, here in the United States, research and development. Some would use those to hire more people. Some would use those to build new facilities or expand their facilities. Uh, one company here in this area that I'll not name uh, said that uh, they would use the dollars to uh, better financially uh, support their pension program for their current pensioners. Uh, they know they're going to have growing liabilities in that pension system and those dollars repatriated back from other foreign earnings would help them uh, meet their obligations under the pension program. It seems to me all of those, and some would uh, use them for just more dividends to their shareholders. It seems to me all of those are very legitimate and appropriate ways to grow the economy here domestically. And uh, we need to give that incentive back to those companies uh, that have those foreign earnings to bring them back here to the United States to do that. Um, I don't recall off the top of my head exactly uh, what the economic impact would be relative to GDP growth or something of that nature, but i got to believe when you're bringing hundreds of billions of dollars back that can be invested into the economy, it's going to have a pretty good positive effect. And so uh, that would be a kind of private sector stimulus. It's not taxpayer dollars. It's their dollars that they're bringing back, repatriating uh, back into our economy uh, that I think uh, is needed to make this economy move forward. So. Uh, I think you're going to see some bipartisan support for that idea. I think you're going to see some bipartisan support to lower the corporate rate. Uh, in fact, the president put forward a proposal to lower it to 28 percent. So the fact that we're at 25, he's at 28 shows you there's a narrowing and uh, coming together on that point. So uh, we've got to get serious about this tax code reform because it's so critical to get it right relative to growing our economy and moving this country forward. And uh, I think it's going to be also in a very exciting uh, adventure as well. Uh, but that repatriation of hundreds of billions of dollars is going to be critical to our growth in the future, and we ought to get on it right now. Well, thank you. Thank you to the congressmen for coming out today. Let's give them a round of applause. I also want to thank all of you for being here today and for giving us such great questions. And this is the type of event that the uh, Greater West Chamber of Commerce will continue to do as we go forward. So thank you. Have a great day, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks, Mark. Good. 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 So, I particularly like the